I've asked you to read a little bit in John Quincy Adams' lectures. They're in the source book. John Quincy Adams, a remarkable figure, member of the House of Representatives, became president, then went back to Congress after. He also taught rhetoric here at Harvard, and he wrote these series of lectures which became a very popular American textbook. He was modeling them in part on some earlier British work. How does his general view of oratory differ from, and how is, is it the same as presented by Corbett? There's one basic difference that I wanted to point out to you because I thought it might confuse you, though there's no, I think, real intellectual confusion involved in it. He calls rhetoric theory and oratory practice. Why does he do that? Because oratory is something you perform. It's practice. And when he's thinking of rhetoric, he's thinking of rhetoric as the study of the elements of rhetoric. And that's fair enough. That's a kind of theory, meaning it's a kind of systematic knowledge. Now, he could have said, under practice, something like composition as well. Because he wasn't thinking just of extemporaneous speaking. Look at his own lectures. They weren't extemporaneous. He wrote them out. Yet he also delivered them. So when you read in Adams that the practice is oratory, I would say think of it as not just oratory, but think of it as anything compositional, anything that involves what we would call creating a document or creating a speech. Aristotle, in his rhetoric, emphasizes what he calls techne, meaning certain principles derived from experience. What does Aristotle mean by that? He means that when he and others sat down to think about speaking and writing, they didn't all of a sudden decide, well, here's how we should do it based on some abstract a priori set of principles. What does a priori mean? It's used in philosophy. It's used other places. Before evidence. Yes, let's get that answer on the mic, because that's exactly it. Before evidence. Yeah, before evidence, before anything, before empirical experience. So the whole way that rhetoric developed as a discipline was not from some a priori principles, not from someone just sitting or saying, here's how it should be done, but actually by looking at compositions and hearing people speak, and then drawing from that practice what we would call best practices, things that work. This is the way that Aristotle wrote his poetics, too, which is about tragedy and Greek tragedy. Aristotle didn't say, here's what I think tragedy ought to be. No. He read and listened to and attended, as far as I know, probably attended, tragedies and their performance and had their texts in front of him. And it was by what people had done that he came to judge what he thought made a good tragedy and what he thought made a lesser tragedy, what the elements of tragedy were, how important each one was, and then making judgments about that. In other words, only from experience in the arts is it possible to draw the best theoretical conclusions. That's at least what Aristotle would say. You've got to have some experience in the performance. You've got to look at it if you're going to decide what the principles of it are. Now, that doesn't mean that the first person who performed or wrote a tragedy did the best job. The first isn't always the best. Sometimes it takes a while for that practice to get around and be refined. And sometimes it reaches a certain pitch, which is its full development or a very good development. It's true in almost all the arts. You think of certain arts that you are familiar with, and you might say, well, such and such was a high point or an important point in the development of a certain kind of sculpture or a certain kind of painting or a certain kind of musical composition. That doesn't mean everyone will agree with you, but it means that <coughs> certain elements of those arts grow and flourish, and they reach a certain stage. And then criticism is constantly looking at the development of those arts and saying, what makes them good? What is happening in these arts? So Aristotle also emphasizes the fact that even if you develop this set of principles, 
when you apply them, you still are in, uh, applying them in a dynamic situation. That is at a particular place, at a particular time, and for a particular purpose. And that may mean that certain principles are more important than others. It may mean that you decide that you don't want a long introduction. Or it may mean that you decide you have to have quite a long explanatory narrative about events because they're complicated or because other people have misrepresented them. It may mean that you think you have to have a particularly strong refutation because you are delivering something which is part of an ongoing debate. You ever notice that in politics where it's not just a complete argument and then a little bit of a refutation, but there's a back and forth. Someone makes an argument, you answer it. When that answer comes out, someone else answers that answer, and so forth. That, in fact, is very often how debate itself works. So there is a dynamic situation you've got to take into account in your particular situation. Not to mention the fact that it isn't just time, place, and purpose, it's audience. So sometimes when people are giving stump speeches, what's a stump speech in politics? Anyone? Caleb got the answer. A sort of stock pitch to voters. Yes, and it's something that is more or less the same every time. And the term comes from standing up on a stump, I assume, as a little platform, and giving a speech. That's your stump speech. But you'll notice that stump speeches are not delivered in exactly the same form to every audience. If you're in the New Hampshire primary, you may say certain things or not say certain things. If you're in the Iowa primary, you may say do or certain things. If you're out in Iowa, you probably will want to eat a corn dog. If you're in New Hampshire, you probably will want to praise uh, maple syrup and the leaves. It all differs. And there have been occasionally some real howlers where politicians have forgotten what state they are in. True, they travel a lot. And they say things in one state that apply to another. This is not a happy situation. But this all goes back to the dynamic of where you are, to what audience you are addressing, the time and place. So what's the result of this? The result of this, you can't really divide theory and practice in rhetoric and oratory, as I've said before. You've got to take both of them into consideration. And Adam sees this interplay. He just happens to express it differently. He just happens to call oratory practice and rhetoric theory. In this class, I consider rhetoric to embrace both. It is both practice and theory. But uh, Adams is coming from a culture where oratory was more formalized, practiced very often, so he regards that as the practice. Corbett actually agrees with the indispensable connection between practice and theory. Anyone doing rhetoric does. I've never come across a complete theoretician in rhetoric. I, I think you couldn't survive in the study of rhetoric if all you had was theory. You've got to have examples. You've got to look at them. And you've got to be able to criticize them. And I would say, although there are some speakers who, and writers who are quite gifted without having formally studied rhetoric, that they have absorbed so much practice of it on their own that they instinctively know many of these principles. On the other hand, as we've already seen, there are some speakers who have studied rhetoric, at least at some level, and they end up being very effective. Douglas is one such individual. Lincoln is another such individual. Jefferson was another such individual, and so on. So it can help a great deal. We talked a little bit earlier in the class about the professions. And the fact that the professions are undertakings in which people are essentially doing something for someone else or another group of people or a client. That it's not purely self-interested. You have a duty to someone other than yourself to serve them to the best of your capacity and the best of your ability. Traditionally, rhetoric has been thought to be a part of all of the professions. And historically, most particularly, having to do with teaching, law, and religion. Because in each one of those professions, it's important for individuals 
uh, and professionals and leaders, whether they be spiritual leaders or political leaders, to be able to communicate, both in writing and orally, to groups of people. Groups of people who may be like-minded, or groups of people who indeed may not be like-minded, especially in the law. You're going to have to argue cases. So, for this reason, the study of rhetoric was indispensable in the history of the West for many hundreds of years. And I think it still is. There are various reasons why it declined in the earlier mid-20th century. I'll talk about that a little later in one of our classes. But rhetoric has now come back up, in part because of the importance of electronic media, the importance of seeing things on YouTube and video, the importance ever since the middle of the 20th century of television. So Adams emphasizes, along with the Roman rhetorician Quintilian, very famous ancient Roman rhetorician, that rhetoric is, or ought to be, not just a means of persuasion. Adams is very clear about this. He says it is also a practice of virtue, a practice that attempts to see virtue prevail knowing that there is not unanimous agreement about what that virtue is. That's a tough assignment. It means you are entering into an arena where there is going to be dissension. This is one of the reasons why people are, frankly, scared of public speaking. Because they're not just getting up there and giving facts. They are arguing something in front of people who may disagree. And that is a scary proposition in many respects. You may arouse emotions in them which are highly negative. Are you ready to do that in front of people? At some point, it may be necessary for you to try to persuade individuals of some matter which you feel is important, but you know that it is very possible they will react negatively to what you say and therefore negatively to you as a person. Is it just for them to react negatively to you as a person? Well, I don't think so, if you're being honest. But does it happen? Sure. Almost every time someone goes out on a limb and makes a strong statement that gets national attention, what do they get on their phone or on their email account? Hmm? Hate mail, yes. Hate mail. That's correct. So it is a scary proposition at the big stage. Maybe you'll never be on that stage. But you'll be on some stage or some platform sometime where there will be a cost, in essence, to what you are doing if you wish to do it. But Adams is very clear that this is important, and it's particularly important in a society that operates by deliberation. We are supposed to deliberate over our laws. We're supposed to deliberate over our elections. We're supposed to deliberate over our policies. We're supposed to deliberate over many things. And unless we're capable of doing that, we end up in the hands of people who do not want deliberation and wish to silence any dissent. So John Quincy Adams is writing after a tradition of Anglo-American rhetoric in the 18th century that comes from, among other individuals, Adam Smith. Now, who's Adam Smith? We all know perhaps something. Seth, give us a thumbnail of Adam Smith. Adam Smith is uh, essentially the father of economics. <clears throat> he, uh, d he wrote a book in 1776 called The Wealth of Nations that kind of described the market forces at play in standard markets and like about market efficiency? Yes, and he'd earlier written another uh, well-known book. Do you know what that was in the late 1750s? I do not know the name. That's all right. That's quite all right. It's called Theory of Moral Sentiments. And, and it's basically a book about how society gets along with itself or doesn't. But do you know what the first thing Adam Smith did was in his career? First thing he taught? Rhetoric. That's how he began his teaching career. It was important to him. Students kept notes of his teaching rhetoric, and they have been published. 
almost every individual who did not engage in a strictly quantitative field was studying rhetoric in order to present their findings to the rest of the world. Who's Joseph Priestley? Mm, this is a history of science question. Your name again is Sam. Sam. Yeah. Who's Joseph Priestley? I, I know him as a writer. I've read some of his like, ret pieces of rhetoric and some of his plays, but I don't know much more about him. All right. Joseph Priestley is credited with discovering what element in the 18th century? I think it's oxygen. He was a political radical. He decided to come to the American colonies when his arguing for greater freedom in Great Britain was frowned upon. He wrote lectures on rhetoric and oratory. Thomas Sheridan, related to the playwright, was read by Lincoln, was read by uh, Emerson, was read by Walt Whitman. Uh, Thomas Jefferson studied rhetoric at William and Mary. And we'll come across Jefferson's study of rhetoric when we look at the Declaration of Independence. The point here is simply that so many individuals in different professions began studying rhetoric. Anybody know who Blackstone was? I was talking, was it, I was talking with Vinnie, but yeah. Who's Blackstone? Who's Blackstone, Vinnie? Yep. Um, he wrote a famous legal commentary, it's called Blackstone's Commentaries, that talked about a lot of the legal, thing, legal issues that are relevant today. Yes, Blackstone's Commentaries, 1770s, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, was hugely influential in the American colonies in Great Britain. It's a foundational text of law in the English-speaking world. Blackstone couldn't decide whether what he really wanted to study was law or literature and rhetoric. But he ended up doing law, but his study in language held him in really good stead. So the background of so many of these individuals is that of some form of training or teaching, actually, of rhetoric. Why? Because it's communication. It is communication at its most basic level, which is important in every profession. Let's turn to Martin Luther King Jr.'s address, which he gave at the Lincoln Memorial. As you pull that out, I just make a couple quick remarks about his background as a speaker. He had church upbringing. And already, when he was just about nine or 10 years old, he would astonish members of his family and friends with his ability to speak. He had it. Don't forget, when he gives this address, he is a young man. I think he's in his middle 30s. He's something like 34 when he gives this address. So he has this ability from a young age. He goes to, he goes to Morehouse College at age 15. So he's precocious in a good way. He studies systematic theology. He ends up getting an advanced degree from Boston University across the river. You've been to the Lincoln Memorial, uh, perhaps. And what does it look like? How would you describe it if you just saw it from a distance as a building? It looks like a temple. Yes, it looks like a temple. And your name again was Corbin. Corbin. Colton, sorry, Colton. It looks like a temple. In fact, not only does it look like a temple, it says right on it, this temple is dedicated. Yeah, it says it right on it. It's a secular temple. And when you walk inside, there are a couple of texts in it. Does anyone remember what those texts are or might be? 